was about 2.30 in the morning, mid-July 2007, I quietly crept into the driveway, entered the side door, took my shoes off before going inside to minimize noise. I undressed in the living room and tried to sneak into the bedroom without disturbing Virginia. But as I turned down the sheet, suddenly she was up. She was agitated, she was angry, she was crying and saying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Soon she was right in front of me, pounding on my chest. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I hadn't thought of it that way previously, but suddenly it occurred to me. And I reached out, I hugged her, I said, I'm trying to save the world one polar bear at a time. You see, about uh, three months earlier, Secretary of Interior Dirk Kempthorne had charged our lab in Alaska with informing him how to respond to a petition to list polar bears as a threatened species. I'd been doing research in Alaska, and I was in charge of polar bear research for about 27 years uh, before that challenge came in, and I had an able team working with me. But what he was asking was going to require about three years worth of research to be done in six months. Fortunately, we were able to bring in nine other experts with particular talents that could help us address the challenge that lay before us. I was still really sweating it, however, because I knew that it was going to fall to me to figure out how to synthesize the information that was available in a way that would most inform the secretary. In response, I literally moved into the office. I put a sleeping pad in the corner, brought in a hot plate. Virginia was bringing me sandwiches and uh, snack food. But for the three months leading up to that July night, Virginia and I hardly saw each other. And when we did, it was literally in passing with no meaningful interaction. As the stress of that situation was building up in Virginia, the importance of our challenge was building up on me. It was becoming ever more clear that if we could improve the future for polar bears, that we could benefit the rest of life on Earth. The challenge that the secretary received was based on the fact that polar bears feed on two species of seals, ringed and bearded seals, and that they catch these seals from the surface of the sea ice. But the sea ice had been in substantial retreat. So how can I explain that? Well, when I first went to Alaska in 1980, I could stand on the beach of the northern shore of Alaska, and I could look out and see the ice. It was right there. By the latter years of my time in Alaska, the sea ice was so far offshore, it was beyond the curvature of the Earth. Even the most powerful telescope wouldn't resolve the sea ice because it was just not there anymore. Now, the implications of this for polar bears were pretty straightforward from a conceptual excuse me, from a conceptual standpoint, because our early radio telemetry work had shown that polar bears preferred to live on the sea ice in shallow waters adjacent to the continental shelf. But those were the very waters from which the ice had been receding. Now, the secretary needed a little bit more detail than that. So we provided a series of nine technical reports, including the synthesis that by the middle of the century, we could lose two-thirds of the world's polar bears. And by the end of the century, we might lose them all. Now, the secretary was apparently persuaded by our arguments. And in May of 2008, he listed polar bears as a threatened species. I thought this was a great thing. Polar bears were clearly biologically threatened. They ought to be legally threatened, too. But I have to admit that. Then and now, I have a problem with the process of listing. We had to specify a time frame in a foreseeable future. And most biological determinations incorporate some kind of a time frame. But when the challenge is global warming, the time frame is really not as important as you might think. We were challenged to, question, to ask what would be the result or what would be the outcome for polar bears in 45 years? Well, why 45 years? 
The important thing is not when something is likely to occur in the case of global warming, but rather that it's likely to occur because we've got a track record of about 20 years of not doing anything at all about the path that we're on. A uh, prominent politician recently said, well, the reason the climate is changing is because the climate has always changed. And indeed, if you look at the history of temperatures on Earth, for the last many, many years, there's a lot of variation. There's El Nino, there's La Nina, uh, volcanic eruptions, this roller coaster ride of natural variation in the weather and in the climate has always been there. But the important thing is that when greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are stable, as they've been for most of the time during which humans have flourished, it's a straight line. It's a level line. So we can use that level line to predict from our past experience, when we might plant crops, when we might harvest, or what kind of clothes I need to pack if I'm going to Cleveland. When greenhouse gas concentrations are steadily rising, less heat is escaping from the top of the atmosphere than is coming in from the sun, and the world has to warm. The laws of physics require the world to warm. All that natural variation, however, is still occurring. So if you were to ask me, when is the last year my ice skating pond is going to freeze, or when is the first year it's too hot to grow wheat in Kansas, that's a hard question to answer. But the important thing is not when that might occur, but we know if we stay in our, our, our uh, current path that we will ultimately exceed both of those thresholds. The case of polar bears is a classic one. We know from work that we published in 2010 that there's a linear relationship between sea ice extent and temperature. Warmer temperatures, less ice. But if you try and predict when summer sea ice might disappear, there's a lot of variation in the answers. And especially if you look at climate model projections for the next few decades, there's a big range of when they predict something's going to happen. The important thing is, that if you look far enough into the future, all of that variation kind of disappears and they converge on no sea ice. So the important thing is that rather than when. Polar bears are a great example of what we're doing to the world uh, in terms of global warming, the threats, and they're also a messenger about what's really important in addressing that threat, the that versus the when. But there are closer examples, examples closer to home. Snowshoe hares depend on an environment in the wintertime that matches their coat color. When they're in a situation where there isn't any snow, Zimova and others working just east of here in Montana show that they have a 7% per week lower survival rate. And they projected that by the latter part of this century, there would be major population declines. But should we care when they might disappear? Or should we be concerned about that they will? Eric Beaver and others have been working on pikas in the Great Basin for a long time. And what they found is over the last 100 years, pikas that live in rock slopes high in the mountains have been going higher and higher into the mountains because the moisture regime and the snow cover that they need is moving higher and higher. Soon it'll be above the tops of the mountains. Then what will the pikas do? Should we be concerned about predicting when that happens? Or should we be concerned about that it's going to happen? Westerling and others showed that by the early 2000s, the western wildfire season was 78 days longer than it was in the 70s and early 80s. Warmer temperatures and early spring snowmelt are the, are the uh, main predictors of what the fire season is like, what the frequency of fire is like. We know 
that for the last several decades, we've seen a one degree Celsius, or one degree Fahrenheit increase in average temperatures across North America. Soon it'll be seven degrees. Should we wait to see when the fire season is going to be 150 days? Or should we acknowledge our, to ourselves that we got to work on preventing those ever longer fire seasons? Sea level rise gets a great deal of attention. The average sea level in 50 years or 100 years, what the sea level rise is going to be, everybody wants to know. But we know that 120,000 years ago, when it was a degree warmer than it is now, sea level was six meters higher than it is now. Florida looked like a mere shadow of its current self. If we had those conditions now, 10 million Floridians would be displaced. Should we be concerned about the next 100 years, or should we be concerned that we're on a path we might not like? Average summer temperatures are likely to be warmer as the latter part of this century than anything we've ever experienced. That's going to assure food and water shortages, refugee problems like we have never experienced before. Do we want to sit around and predict when we're going to cross certain thresholds, or should we just recognize that we will? Fortunately, there are a lot of people that have shown that there is something we can do about it. It's going to take a Herculean effort, something like the Apollo Project, but we can do it. And in Paris recently, the world got together and agreed we need to do something about this, and they established goals. That's a great step forward, but we have a problem. Many of our elected representatives don't want to achieve those goals. They don't want to tackle climate change. They don't want to do anything about it, and in fact, are standing in the way. That's a problem. In 2010, my colleagues and I showed, showed that uh, if we stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations, we can bring that curve of downward trending sea ice to a level line. We can assure that there is polar bear habitat. If we do that, we also will assure a better world for future generations. All of the future generations that we care about. So, I'm going to close by asking everybody here, everybody who listens to this, to do me a favor. I would like everybody, you know who they are, you know who our leaders are who are standing in the way of doing something about climate change, doing something about global warming. They're clearly not looking out for our best interests or the best interests of our future generations. Write them, email them, call them and ask them the question that Virginia asked me on that long ago summer night. Why are you doing this? Thank you. <laughs>